introduce Giuliano Testa. Dr. Testa specializes in living donor liver transplantation for both adult and pediatric patients and is the surgical director of living donor liver transplantation at Baylor University Medical Center. Dr. Testa is world renowned for his surgical expertise in this field. In 2018, Dr. Testa was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People for his work as the principal investigator on uterus transplant clinical tri trial. His groundbreaking work resulted in a successful functional uterine transplant and the first baby born via uterus transplant in the U.S. Today, Dr. Testa will give a talk titled The Ethics of Transplanting Patients with Acute Alcoholic Hepatitis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Testa. So, um, no, no matter what the 100, uh, whatever that was, uh, this is the highlight of uh, what I consider my academic year. So every time I get invited by Mark, I says, yes, I made it this year too. Uh, this is, there is a quid pro quo in that because I invite Mark every two years in Italy, so yeah, I kind of notch that. Um, but I have to thank you also for uh, allowing uh, people like me to have a voice in front of uh, these distinguished professors that a much greater uh, in understanding of what we do. I I'm just a, a, a surgeon that tries to apply these uh, principles to my daily life. I think I've done that much better so since I completed the fellowship. And as a disclaimer, one of the reasons why the uterus transplant program has been so successful is also because it was really founded, although some people in the room might disagree, on what I believe were strong ethical principle. At least our ethics commission was very in favor of that. And today we have five kids and one more next week. I think we can say something about that. Uh, so, uh, but today I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about something that is very close to my daily activity and has really created a fracture in the transplant world and has a very distinct uh, and very visceral uh, reaction very, open, very often. And this is the acute alcoholic hepatitis. So the, the, the idea of transplanting uh, patients because of uh, chronic liver disease due to alcohol is, is an old idea, of course, and today is, is common ground. Uh, but now the nuclei in the box are the patients who are affected by acute alcohol alcoholic hepatitis, which means they uh, practically have ingested such an amount of alcohol uh, that have uh, created an acute failure of the liver. And now most of them are lying in the intensive care unit, and without a transplant, they will die. And uh, it's very tremendously clear to all the clinicians that when no therapy means death in the great majority of patients, and therapy, which in this case is only liver transplant, means survival. And uh, to give you an idea of how intense this problem is, uh, this is, those are the curves. Not only now today the alcohol is the number one indication for liver transplantation in this country, but uh, alcoholic hepatitis is becoming a, a big chunk of uh, of these uh, of these patients, and uh, I assume that most of us, in this, me included, uh, enjoy some form of drink. Uh, so it's a, it's a social, I would say, social norm. Uh, but also, I have to uh, uh, take position with the fact that the alcohol is one of the worst in terms of self-induced damage and damage to others in comparison to other leisure, whatever activities you may, you may discuss. And uh, this, is, this is unfortunately the reality in this country, uh, whereby the numbers are staggering in terms of what alcohol does. I'm not going to read it, but those are real. And this is a, another thing done by, I think, reputable people, Harvard School of Public Health. Um, so those are uh, the, the statistics or the numbers they have regarding college. So those are our, our, those are our kids the last time I checked. And uh, the, the important thing is that unfortunately, this thing that we see in the ICUs uh, very often has to do with very young people. So it's, it's a very sensitive issue. So one argument is, you know, what, what if we did have livers for everybody? Would be in that case, uh, transplant everybody with uh, acute alcoholic hepatitis. And you know, talking around comes down there, probably not, 
Uh, there are reasons why we probably say no, even if we had unlimited number of organs and have to do probably with clinical indications in some cases, or maybe have to do with the fact that uh, we have lack of social support, which seems to be a very important issue in taking care of these patients, or maybe some people, people really have no clue, and so why would you uh, transplant these patients? But reality is that uh, the scarcity is real, so that's what we live today. There is a supply and demand. And so I want to give you uh, an interesting twist on this. Uh, wh while preparing for this talk, and I have had a very, uh, I'm, I'm very ambiguous about this uh, to the point that I apologize for some of the mistakes because I kept uh, correcting what I was going to say today, and uh, so there may be some errors in, in the grammar in the, in the talk. But the bottom line, is I want to say there are two fields in my opinion, and one is. Uh, uh, and one I will put, uh, I'll put on the spot, uh, Mark Siegler. Uh, so I call those the Siglerians. And the other one I want to put on the spot, Elisa and, uh, and Don Care. And uh, so I will call them the Don Care and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Gordonians or Elysians. And, uh, and the reality is that uh, Mark wrote a paper in 1991, and they're completely different opposite view, but they represent really what we feel every day in the listing committee when we have to decide who gets the liver, who doesn't get the liver. And so, bottom line, Mark wrote a paper in 1991, which is a, a very good paper, to which I have to say, if Mark is the leader, I was a proselyte, and I, I, that was my credo. And, um, and so, the, the, the idea of the paper is that there is a moral responsibility in self inducing a damage to yourself, and you have to bear the responsibility. And since we have a scarcity of the organs, that plays a role in the decision making process to whom that specific liver would go. So that's really the, 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 the fundus of that paper, if I read it correctly. So uh, in few words, what, what it is, that there is, if there is fairness in all of this, then you have to be fair toward the one on the list who did not inflict the damage to their own liver, and they are there because they have autoimmune hepatitis, uh, primary sclerosis cholangitis, whatever other disease we have to transplant. And uh, although you want to talk about justice, well, there is justice also in saying that not everybody is equal, and some people are unequal because uh, they've been doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And, uh, and the treatment falls upon the, and the responsibility falls upon the patient. So this is a very characteristic view of many of us, me included, that I have held this view for a, for a long, long time. So in a certain way, the Siglerian wants fairness toward the older people on the list in, in a certain way and demand, and demand that there is insight and competence for the patients. And little children, there you have it. So, um, in, the, in, the, in the other view, which we call the, the uh, Gordonian wood, and that, that's, that's a different point. What counts is the clinical picture and not the morals behind it. And, uh, and uh, in a certain way, when we make decisions, we have to focus on the clinical issues, not on why or the cause of the, of, of the disease. And also, we have to have be beneficent, so we have to treat our patients one by one. And most importantly, I think that's a very important point for the specific of this talk, uh, we need to be non-maleficent, because the moment you ask somebody to become abstinent for six months before you can activate them to transplant, you may cause some harm because that liver disease may progress or may uh, even worsen to the point you can't transplant anymore and the patient may die. And, uh, and so uh, the, 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 to this Gordonian argument, there is the Dockerian, uh, those are papers written in 2016 and 2019. So those are m more recent. Maybe there's been evol an evolution in thinking during this time because one is 91, one is 2000. But the bottom line is that uh, important the utility uh, is the, the argument of the Gordonian is that you need to have sufficient graft and patient support. So this is all clinical, right? And uh, so what really makes us a little dubious about this is that well, number one is what are the outcomes, and number two, what are the data? 
The data show that in reality, number one, if you don't get the transplant, you die in 70% of the cases. And number two is that the slip or the relapse, which are two separate issues, occur in a very minority of the patient. So those are the data that we have. And if you want to really have the results, those are the ones. The one-year survival and three-year survival is no different than any other disease we transplant, and uh, uh, the relapse uh, are small. And if you compare the two categories of alcoholic, the one that are chronic alcoholic that are asked to, abstain, uh, to be abstinent for six months, and the one who are just put on the list right away because otherwise they're going to die, their survival is not different. So those are the data that we have. So if the data are not different, then the allocation should be the same. And scarcity doesn't play a role in the decision that we make. Um, and on top of that, we all know that the, the, the organs are public good, and so you need to take that in account in a certain way. And what we do the right to do is uh, two main principles. One is uh, optimize the use of a scarce resource, and to be fair when we allocate the resource. Those are the two principles I think we are going to apply. I'm going to kind of skip this because at the time I would like to have some uh, feedback because I doubt myself. Um, in uh, acute, what, what ALF stands for in, in reality is for acute alcoholic hepatitis, so uh, alcoholic liver failure. In that case, the, the situation is even worse or more difficult to uh, discern because these people are not competent. Most of them are in the ICU intubated or completely unconscious. So they cannot go abstinent and they cannot give you an informed consent of any kind. And the most important thing is that if you don't do it, they're going to die. So, where do we have the hanging point? Is the relapse, number one, which is a medical entity, and the fairness, how we allocate the livers. Th those are the two things. And um, of course, you may argue, as it was argued, that in reality, not everybody knows that it's self-inflicting a, a, a problem on itself. I have a problem with that, to be honest. I ask myself in 2020 almost uh, if people really don't know that alcohol is so bad for you, but maybe. Uh, but also, it's also true, the, it's, it's, it's a little um, tricky. The al alcohol is tricky. Isn't it? On one side, we stigmatize the people who drink too much. On the other side, we all enjoy the little glass of wine or bourbon or whatever it is. So the way in the middle is always difficult to find in real life. So can, we, can I or can we envision a moment in which the Siglerian and the Gordonian uh, and Docarenian can come together to a common ground and find if we can really help this patient without, at the same time, uh, harming the other ones on the list. Um, well, you can take a very hardcore position. No one with acute alcoholic hepatitis gets a liver transplant. That means that most of them will die. Everybody gets it which means that some people will get, they shouldn't get it, and some more people on the list will die, they shouldn't be dying if you had access to that liver. And the reality, one little caveat I haven't told you this far is that most of these patients have such a high MELD, the MELD is the scoring system we use to list them, they're so high, they supersede everybody else on the list in the same region, and so they end up having excellent graft that we never see for anybody else on the list. So, um, the idea may be we should really try to select them up front so well that only the ideal acute alcoholic hepatitis patient end up getting the liver, maximizing the net survival of what we have. Um, so who will be these patients? Will be the one that have uh, only one episode documented of acute alcoholic hepatitis? Will be the one that um, they have no prior sign of liver disease, so they don't have cirrhosis, they have chronic liver disease. Uh, they have uh, no history having to have a bad impact on their families or work environment or society in general, and they have a good support system. I can tell you that for whatever we see, um, my hepatologists tell me, our, our is a big center, on a daily census, we have between five and seven acute alcoholic hepatitis in-house. So this is a big deal. And I can tell you about this. I cannot see any of this one that have all these characteristics at the same time. So it's very difficult to super select this patient for this form of therapy. So this is what we have, but I think selection may be a proper selection, and using all the help we have to make that decision is a place where we can have a common ground in trying to solve these issues that I have in myself. Now, the, the, the last question I have is, do we have a system in place? We need to have addiction specialists to take care of this patient. 
Instead, we are doing this transfer in the United States without this support system, which means that probably the relapse rate will be much higher than that. Can we agree between a relapse and a sip? I'll give you an example. If I transplanted somebody who was an alcoholic before, he was abstinent for six months, and three years after liver transplant, he drinks a glass of wine, I go, I'm not going to judge him. That's what I drink. It doesn't mean he's going to become an alcoholic again. So are we ready to make this distinction as a, as a, as a group of physicians or as the public? Um, the other thing that I have a problem with is the poster child. Every time you hear a talk about acute alcoholic hepatitis, it comes down to the mom of 35 with two kids home. <laughs> well, what about the mom of 35 with two kids home who's got autoimmune hepatitis or primary liver cirrhosis? I mean, those are patients too. And if you have both of them on the list at the same med score, and the alcoholic one gets the liver and the other one doesn't and dies, where is the fairness? I don't know, I'm just posing these questions. And then the competence, where does competence begin? Is only the one intubated in the ICU who's not competent, or shouldn't be he or she competent before they start drinking to the point of becoming stuporous and then comatose and then losing their liver? So those are the things that, at the end of the day, one irony of the case, if I'm an alcoholic, I did my six months of abstinence and, and being uh, penitent to all of you guys, and I'm finally on the list, but my male is 25, and an acute alcoholic comes from the side and gets my liver. At the end of the day, I should be pissed because I did what the rules asked me to do, and I got bypassed by the young guy on the list. So this is what I have. Thank you for your attention. Be nice, be nice. Uh, I'm going to be very nice, Juliana. I, I actually just want to bring up a couple of facts that I think will help. The first is that most people who are alcoholics actually started drinking when they were teenagers, in fact, young teenagers, which when you get to the question of responsibility and whether we should be blaming individuals, we need to think about the fact that these are children who are the adult alcoholics. The second fact that I think we have to add is that by 2040, the main cause won't be alcoholic hepatitis, but it's going to be NASH from obesity. And to the extent that we're going to blame alcoholics, we're also going to then need to blame um, people who are obese. And people who are obese will tell you that it's both that there's a genetic component, clinical component, and we downplay the behavior component nowadays. Well. I'm not sure that you can really distinguish between obesity and alcoholism. They might have a different impact on my effectiveness at work. They might not, actually. And so I just, if we're going to start discriminating, we're going to find out that the only people who are really, quote, worthy of livers are going to be the young children. Uh, and you are absolutely right. If you talk to addiction specialists, they don't define alcohol as a moral or whatever issue. They define alcohol as a disease, and they have a list this long of psychiatric disorder that may be associated with alcoholism, which is a lot of many of these of these patients. You're right. I, as a former surgeon, I have great respect for what you do, <clears throat> but I'm worried about this idea about what you offer. And my background as a surgeon, I did CT surgery. And when I was at Stanford doing a transplant fellowship back in the 1980s, we did a heart transplant on a young woman in her 30s with amyloidosis. And we didn't know what would happen, actually. We didn't, really didn't know what would happen. But she had this systemic disease, and she was dying of heart failure. So we transplanted her, and she got recurrent amyloidosis and died of heart failure, I, I think, a couple years later. I don't think it's help, helpful at all to moralize um, uh, people with substance use disorder. I see a lot of pa uh, patients in Louisville now in the opioid crisis of America right there that we're trying to palliate. Uh, who has a life-limiting disease. So I, don't, I don't use the term addict, because I think people are more than the drug that they take. But I do worry about the fact that this alcoholic person has a brain disease, and that will influence the survival of his homograft that you put in. And so, uh, much like the amyloid patient, which we didn't really know what would happen, and I don't think anybody's doing that now, um, I worry about that as we think about the scarcity of resources, which is just a reality. So, and that would be, in few words, that would be very valid if we could demonstrate, and thus far we don't have that kind of data, that the recidivism or the relapse of the alcohol does affect the survival of the graft 
or the patient. And thus far, if you compare the survival long term of these patients to the one that have been transplanted for other reasons, there is, there is no difference. So that's the argument, that's the strongest argument that the, one, the ones in favor of transplanting this patient bring forward all the time. I'm just stating the fact, I'm not telling that that's my position, but that's what it is. Thank you. I'm afraid our time is up, but we need to hear from the Siglerian. <laughs> a year after I wrote the 1991 paper, uh, I was on a panel with Tom Starzl, and Starzl was incensed with that 91 paper, and he had had data that he was about to publish, which he published soon thereafter, on 38 or 39 uh, transplants in patients with alcoholism who had not gone through periods of abstinence. Um, and um, among his patients, there were only two or three relapses of alcoholism. And in fact, he said at the panel that perhaps the ideal treatment for alcoholism is a liver transplant because there's no recidivism. Um, and I just want you to know that over the years, uh, I have moved uh, in, in the Starzl direction, and, um, and, and particularly with regard to acute alcoholic hepatitis. And I thought that your four factors to consider in distinguishing among potential recipients who had alcoholic hepatitis were, were quite extraordinary and very much on target. So one of the most famous transplant surgeons that ever was at the University of Chicago, Christoph Brosch, he, he said and he stated many times that in his opinion, liver transplantation is a cathartic experience and nobody will go back to drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Thank you.